a very warm welcome to all the participants of 2080 CEE. I hope you all are preparing and now we are going to look into the questions of last years that were recalled by all the PG aspirants. So we shall be discussing about orthopedics. And hi, I am Dr. Lokra Chorishya and I am a consultant orthopedics and a microsurgeon. So we shall discuss about questions on orthopedics. Let's go to our first question asked last year. So the question is, there is pain and swelling in the great toe. Most probable diagnosis is so gout, pseudogout, osteoarthritis and septic arthritis. So as you see, the hint in the question is, itself is pain and swelling in the great toe. So let us see all these viable options. So gout and pseudogout, both these are crystal deposition disorders, while osteoarthritis is a non-inflammatory arthritis, while septic arthritis is an infective arthritis. So let us see all the locations. So first, let us differentiate among gout and pseudogout. This can be the probable questions. So in gout, there is monosodium urate crystal deposition, while in pseudogout, there is calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate deposition, CPPD. Then while the monosodium ure uretic crystals are negatively biorepresent and it occurs more commonly in males, it mostly affects the smaller joints of the foot and ankle and olecranon bursa. So among the smaller joints of the foot and ankle, usually it's the MCP joint of great toe. Metacar metatarsal phalangeal joint of great toe is most commonly affected in case of gout, while similarly in case of pseudogout, it is usually the knee joint that is affected and the classical questions that they can also ask is, there is calcification of the meniscus seen in the x-ray, what can be the probable diagnosis? So if there is calcification of meniscus in x-ray, the correct answer will be pseudogout. But if they ask for uh, pain and swelling in the great toe, or they can also ask pain and swelling of the metatarsal phalangeal joint of great toe, then it will be gout. The other differences are given below. So let us see about the rest, other two options the osteoarthritis. Similar type of picture, they can uh, confuse you with. Uh, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So let me make it clear with these two pictures. So on the right side we have the osteoarthritis where it mainly affects the larger joints, the hip, the hip, the knee and the spine. In the hand it mainly affects the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb. The base of the thumb is mostly affected and then it is usually the DIP, dorsal interphalangeal joint that is affected. But in case of rheumatoid arthritis, usually the CMC, carpometacarpal joint is not affected while it is mostly the proximal interphalangeal joint and metacarpophalangeal joint which is affected in rheumatoid arthritis. Take a note, in osteoarthritis it is the DIP joint which is affected. While in case of rheumatoid arthritis, in case of rheumatoid arthritis, it is the PIP and the MCP joint that is affected. So the correct answer for this question is pain and swelling the great toe. So it is gout. It can also be pain and swelling in the metatarsal phalangeal joint. Coming to the next question, a patient complains of pain on leg. After sustaining accident on examination, compartment syndrome was diagnosed. Which of the following is most suggestive of compartment syndrome? So, if you see all these answers, all these answers are uh, suggestive of compartment syndrome. But which is the most suggestive one? So, all these suggest compartment syndrome. But let us see, like what happens in compartment syndrome. For example. Let's say this is the cross section of the forearm. So, what happens in compartment syndrome? 
due to poor blood supply there is initial edema and uh, this edema leads to further vascular compromise that is another vicious cycle this compromise this edema further compromises the vascularity that leads to further edema and that leads to further co vascular compromise so it has generally been seen that deep compartment of the forearm is affected okay it is the deep compartment of forearm that is affected so they can also ask which is the most commonly affected muscle so if you see it is the fdp and fpl which is most commonly affected now let us see the signs uh, signs so all these options are suggestive of uh, compartment syndrome but these are the signs this is the sequence in which all these uh, signs they appear so this is the sequence in which all these appear so the first sign that appears in case of compartment syndrome is pain out of proportion to examination or the other option can be pain with passive stretch so if there is pain on passive stretch you can suggest compartment syndrome or if there is pain out of proportion it can be a compartment syndrome but in case of children similarly uh, they complain of pain that is not controlled by the usual dose of analgesic okay so just uh, take care of the question what it is specifically asked they can easily confuse you so pain out of proportion to examination is the first sign to appear followed by paresthesia that is different sensation and then the pallor of the limb paralysis and last one to appear is the pulse pain so the correct answer for this is pain pain out of proportion so these are threshold for all the muscles to survive in case of compartment syndrome okay. so in case of a compartment syndrome this should be released as early as possible so this is the vicious cycle as i explained there is a trauma that leads to arterial spasm arterial occlusion that leads to muscle ischemia and that causes again edema which causes increase in intramuscular pressure that again causes venous lymphatic and arterial compression and so this is a uh, constant continuous cycle that goes on and, and on till the limb is completely jeopardized or something so the correct question answer for this question is patient complaints of pain or on leg after sustaining accident on examination compartment syndrome was diagnosed which is the most suggestive is it is the pain out of proportion so coming to the next question a patient with shoulder dislocation and underwent closed reduction after some days patient presents with inability to abduct shoulder more than 30 degrees and complains pain on doing so on examination deltoid muscle atrophy was present which of the following structure might be injured so since the patient is already able to abduct the shoulder more than 30 degrees and complains of pain on doing so so let us see what happens for the initial 30 degrees the rotator cuff are responsible for this movement from 30 to 90 degrees it is the deltoid which is responsible and more than 90 degrees it is the serratus anterior So, since the patient is already able to abduct till 30 degrees, the rotator cuff are normal. So, this supraspinatus is definitely not the answer. Traplegis, it causes elevation of the shoulder, that is not the answer. Now, this. So, um, the deltoid is weak. So, this deltoid is supplied by axillary nerve. Okay, so it is supplied by axillary nerve. So likely the injured structure is axillary nerve. 
so let us see the relation so what happens when this is the normal so if you see the axillary nerve it just hooks around the uh, neck of humerus it goes and it just hooks around so whenever there is uh, shoulder dislocation this axillary nerve gets stressed and so this axillary nerve can result in deltoid paralysis so if there is deltoid paralysis the patient would not be able to abduct the shoulder more than 30 degrees another way of asking the same question is uh, there is loss of sensation in the regiment batch area or in the batch area so this is the regiment batch area so which is the likely injured nerve so again the answer is axillary nerve so uh, so this is a picture showing the relation of the axillary nerve the radial nerve and the axillary ulnar nerve in relation to the uh, shaft of humerus so the correct answer for this question is axillary nerve so the next question is in spondylolisthesis cause is defect in pars interarticularis interspinous ligaments interlaminal or interbody so first let us review the anatomy of the vertebra so this is the vertebral body these are the two pedicles then you have the transverse process this is the superior process and this is the superior articular facet this is the transverse process this part this part is the lamina remember this part is the lamina this is the spine of the vertebra so where this lamina the supraarticular facet inferior articular facet the pedicle the meat this is the pars interarticular so what happens in case of spondylolisthesis is that there is a defect in there is a defect in this part into articularis and due to which the vertebra the above vertebra is not able to held in position it moves slightly anteriorly it moves anteriorly so in case of spondylolisthesis there is anterior translation of the vertebra okay and depending on uh, depending on the movement can be graded as grade 1 2 3 4 and also like if you see this picture so if you see this is green it looks like there is a dog with its two limb and there is a ribbon on the neck so it is a scottish dog it gives a scottish dog appearance on uh, x ray so this is then x ray so if you see this there is movement anterior translation of the vertebra of l5 over s1 this is the limb this is the neck the head so a scottish dog appearance so there can another be another question like scottish dog appearance is found in uh, spondylolisthesis or there can also be uh, in uh, which of the following is seen on the x ray in the case of spondylolisthesis so it can be again scottish dog and scottish dog appearance so the correct answer is there is a defect in pars interarticularis that leads to spondylolisthesis next question a football player has sustained injury in right knee few months ago he now comes with complaints of pain and feeling of instability of right knee joint most probable cause is so let us see the clue in this question there is pain as well as instability so all these structures they cause pain but let us see what are the things that cause instability so it can be mcl the ligament middle collateral ligament and anterior cruciate ligament that causes instability osteoarthritis discans it causes the pain in the knee or there can be locking of the knee meniscus it causes locking of the knee or can be 
pain is. It can also cause pain or locking in the knee. Now, see, since he is a footballer, so most commonly uh, anterior cruciate ligament is injured in case of a footballer whenever there is a twisting injury. Okay, so the correct answer for this question is anterior cruciate ligament injury. So, coming to the next question. Which of the following is the cause of osteomyelitis in IV drug user patient? So, the cause of osteomyelitis in an IV drug users. So, let us see this chart. So, in case of newborn, in 4 months of age, Staph aureus, gram negative bacilli, and group B, streptococci are the most common cause. In children 4 months or older, Staph aureus, Group A, Streptococci, Hemophilus influenzae has been eliminated by rapid immunization. Similarly, in case of adults of 21 years age or more, Staph aureus is the most common cause. In sickle cell anemia, Salmonella is the most common cause of osteomyelitis. Similarly, in case of IV drug abuse or osteomyelitis of the medial or lateral end of clavicle or whenever there is puncture wound through shoes, pseudomonas is the most common cause. So, in this question, IV drug abuser, in case of so IV drug abuser, the most common cause of osteomyelitis, the answer is pseudomonas. Okay. So, coming to other thing, other options too, late stage is AIDS and CAT. It is the Bartonella ancillary, and in case of long term IV medication, like uh, there can be some hospital conditions, uh, illness that cause uh, in which a patient requires a long term IV medication, or in case of immunocompromised patients, it is Candida. So, in this question, since the patient is an IV drug user, is not on IV medications or is not a compromised, so Candida is not the answer. It is the pseudomonas is the answer. So this is a table showing the list of uh, organisms that can happen with bite injury. These are also most commonly asked questions in the MCQs. So in case of human bite, it is usually the streptococcus viridens, bacterioids, streptococcus, staph epidermidis. In case of cat, pastoral chest, tennis, cat. Pastorella multocida, rat, streptococcus monoliformis, pig, it is polymicrobial, pig viper, again it is pseudomonas. So, this chart also needs to be remembered. So, osteomyelitis in case of IB drug user is pseudomonas. Coming to next question a patient presents with loss of appetite, fever, and back pain, mostly exaggerated during night. So, this question clearly is suggestive of tuberculosis of the spine. There is back pain, fever, and pain usually during the night. X ray is done and no bony abnormalities were found. So, in case of tuberculosis, usually in the initial stages, there is no bony destruction. Okay. So, what happens in the first stage? There is uh, subclinic clinical type, there is no radiological finding. In case second stage, there is radiological finding. Okay, in third stage, there is neurological compromise and fourth stage, the neurological compromise is more than 50%. Okay. So, since there is no, oh, since there is uh, no abnormalities on x-ray, so we are less likely to get the diagnosis on blood workup, CT scan, CT scan. CT scan is an extended X-ray. So usually there is no change in CT scan. So the correct answer is MRI. So let us review about MRI. So radio in case of MRI, it is most sensitive but not specific for tuberculosis. And it also detects lesion in pre-destructive state. Since our, since uh, the question 
uh, ask that there is no change in the x-ray so uh, the patient is in pre-destructive state so MRI is the most appropriate answer and it, it can also di differentiate between granulation tissue and liquid mass and also involvement of the cord. So this is an MRI showing involvement of the vertebra. There is uh, no, there is sparing of the disc. Discs are involved usually in the later stage. And similarly, MRI can also show the skip lesions. Skip lesions in vertebra is seen in tuberculosis of spine. So the correct answer for this question, the most appropriate uh, investigation for the diagnosis is MRI. So coming to next question, a patient presents to emergency with open wound fracture. He sustained injury 20 hours ago. So the clue is, patient has presented after 20 hours so there is a time the golden time period is 6 hours however this is an old concept it is not uh, practical now but since uh, the examiner seems uh, to be following the older concept he has mentioned about 20 hours so we shall be discussed we shall be discussing it in the same concept which is the best management plan. So, after this golden time, after this 6 hours, there is a very high chance of wound getting infected. So, one has to delay the closure. So, the first option is, we need to debride it, but we cannot go for early closure, we need to delay the closure. Had it been, if he had arrived in less than 6 hours, then debridement and early closure. So, remember the golden time period is 6 hours, if the patient comes before 6 hours, we can go for debridement and early closure. But if the patient presents after 20 hours, then the option is debridement and delayed closure. However, if there has been no time period that has been mentioned, one can easily mention any of the answers. Debridement and early closure it will be the best option. A lady 48 years was admitted with fractured shaft of femur. After 72 hours of injury, she developed breathlessness and on examination, her oxygen saturation was 70%. What is the most likely cause of deterioration? The options are fat embolism, air embolism, pulmonary edema, and thromboembolic pulmonary embolism. So, what happens in case of shaft of femur fracture? This is the most common cause of uh, uh, fat embolism okay? and all this fat embolism usually it occurs after 72 hours. So if you see this, her ax uh, there is some blockade to her lung function as in indicated by her oxygen saturation of just 70%. So and since it's after 72 hours, usually fat embolism is very rare. In, within the first 24 hours. So, the fat embolism is likely answer. Pulmonary edema, there is gradual development of symptoms. Okay. And thrombopulmonary embolism, it also de develops within the first 24 hours. So, the fat embolism is the correct answer. A patient presents with herbidin nodes of finger. Which of the following is involved? The DIP joint wrist joint, MCP joint and PIP joint. Remember, like uh, these are Herbeden nodes and the Bouchard nodes. Both of these are the features of osteoarthritis of the hand. So, as I already discussed, like osteoarthritis is mostly affects the DIP joint and the carpometacarpal joint. In this x-ray, if you see, the carpometacarpal joint is involved, the CMC joint, the first CMC joint. It is involved in case of uh, Osteoarthritis, similarly, uh, the uh, DIP and the PIP, they are involved. So, what happens is, Herbeden nodes, they appear on the DIP joint. Bouchards, they appear on the PIP. So, remember, when I write a mnemonic, how I remembered during my preparation days is B and P. 
So, this looks more similar in Bouchard and they appear on PIP joint. Similarly, so Herbaden nodes they appear on DIP. That is how I remember. So, Herbaden on DIP joint, Bouchard on PIP joint. So, the correct answer for this is Herbaden nodes on DIP joint. Similarly, they can ask other questions. Like seagull sign in case of DIP, the first X, the seagull, it appears in case of osteoarthritis of the hand. The bare areas, this occurs in rheumatoid arthritis of the hand. Pencil in cup, you see this, uh, so just resemble, this appears like a pencil held in cup. So this is seen in psoriatic arthritis. And punched out or rat bite. If you see this, some rat has bitten it over here. It appears in case of gouty arthritis of the hand. Thank you.